Hey, it's Mazzy here and welcome back. And uh, this is my take on the 50th anniversary, All Things Must Pass, uh, the wonderful George Harrison debut solo album, aside from Wonderwall and um, Electronic Sounds. Three record set originally in 1970, one record of jams and two records of music co-produced and produced by uh, Phil Spector. There is a, a companion video I'll link below. If you haven't seen it, you might want to watch in, uh, that video and take a look at the overview of the Uber set. I really kind of just show the packaging, and that's the big, giant, humongous, wonderful, over-the-top box set. So the link's below. Uh, that I think that's kind of a fun video to watch. Whether you think it's overkill, whether you appreciate it, wh whether you like the artistic uh, and packaging merits of it, but... Um, you know, I enjoyed and it's a fun set and I was able to get it. So check that video out. The link is below. But on this video, I want to talk about the music. I want to talk about the remix. I want to talk about the outtakes a little bit. I'm not going to go cut for cut for cut. But instead, I think I, what I want to do is just do an overview and a feeling how it works or doesn't work for me. So um, let's dive into this. All Things With Pass. 1970. This is my original copy from 1970. I absolutely love this album. I absolutely love the feel of it, the vibe of it. Pretty much when you think about it, stop and think, this is George Harrison's sort of gospel record. Of course, Harrison's a, a very spiritual uh, gentleman, rock and roller, musician, and, uh, you know, war is religion and war is spirituality on his sleeve. And even though he pontificated and expressed these things, he didn't push other people into believing it. He didn't knock on your door selling that his religious is better than others. It worked for him. He presented it. He sang about it. Uh, he was proud of it. And it's all over this record. And the more I thought about this for this video and even the last few years, um, I want to talk about a couple other records that came out around this time in 1970. I did a video on the gospel according to rock and roll. And that really kind of started out with Delaney and Bonnie and Friends. This is the live album came out um, in 1970, Delaney and Bonnie and Friends with Eric Clapton on tour. George Harrison played some of these gigs. Dave Mason was on part of the tour. And there's a real soul R&B coming out of the Stax. Uh, Delaney and Bonnie came out of the whole Stax thing. Obviously, they went to Electra Records. They went to um, this album. Also came out in 1970, except no substitute. And the genesis of all these records, the nucleus, I should say, of all these records, I would say are Delaney and Bonnie and Friends. Delaney, Bonnie... Jim Gordon, the great, great drummer. Dave Mason's on here. Carl Rattle on bass. Bobby Whitlock on organ and vocals. Um, then Jim Price and Bobby Keys on saxophone. Uh, singers like Rita Coolidge and the like. And all over this, there's sort of a gospel feeling, a rock and roll that I really like. And obviously, Eric Clapton got turned on to it. And George Harrison got immersed into it and really uh, influenced. And that can go back to the band. Uh, this album came out in 69, of course, and there's that rootsy thing that I think a lot of these British artists were kind of getting back into. Obviously, Eric Clapton gets turned on to music for Big Pink. George Harrison kind of gets into this, and of course, with his friend, <laughs> Bob Dylan. And If Not For You, which is on both uh, All Things Must Pass and um, New Morning, just you, you feel that vibe. And I think it's really a, an important... These are important records to talk about when we're talking about All Things Must Pass. Because again, as I listen to it, and I listen to the remix, I listen to the outtakes probably about six times, including at home in my stereo, at my main rig upstairs, which is somewhat of a bright room, a bright system, down in my office in my vintage JBL L100 from the 70s, which is more of a, a darker system, more of a, a muffled room, in, in, you know, quiet, a dark, quiet uh, room which um, brings in a whole other sound to these same records. I also listen to it in my car, the CDs, and I listen to the Blu-rays. So I kind of want to talk about that as I get into this. But here's another one, too. And um, 
Ringo's country album, Buku's, uh, Buku's of Blues, because All Things Has Passed has this underlying country sense to it, the gospel country music. When you strip everything back, when you get rid of um, Phil Spector's production, and even within that, there's a lot of these great songs like uh, Let It Roll, If Not For You, uh, Apple Scruffs, that have this really kind of uh, country flair to it. And obviously, with the addition of the great steel guitar player, Pete Drake, who is on this with the Ringo Starr, it just adds something that's pretty... Uh, wonderful in my book and then just again to give you a few others in the same nucleus of, of the musicians on here leon russell's album his debut album from 1970 as well and of course there's eric clapton ringo Starr, chris stanton delaney and bonnie and so on so there's a there's definitely a nucleus and a, almost like a, a a club and we all know with bangladesh all these musicians that played on bangladesh another album Alone Together from 1970, Dave Mason, same thing, same feel in certain ways. Obviously, every musician you know, did their own take on it and ran with it. And of course, a lot of the nucleus of the band that was uh, you know, really put together from Delaney and Bonnie through All Things Must Pass uh, became Derek and the Dominoes with the great, again, Jim Gordon on drums, Carl Rattle on bass, the great keyboard and organist uh, and singer, Bobby Whitlock, and of course, uh, Eric Clapton. And uh, part of the jams that came out of um, All Things Must Pass were really kind of this band getting ready. And Phil Spector started producing uh, the first singles off this uh, with George Harrison and uh, Derek and the Dominoes. So let's get into the music. I've been having some conversations with friends about this record uh, for the last you know year or so because we've been leading up to this uh, 50th anniversary delayed by the pandemic. And I'm on the forums quite a bit, uh, the Hoffman forums and several other Beatle forums. And uh, we debate, people debate and talk about it. And there's this whole, what I see as a revisionist view of all things must pass, where all of a sudden, or at least in the last maybe 10, 20 years, for some people, they don't like the Phil Spector production. They don't like the wall of sound. They think it's overwrought. They think it's bombastic, especially with songs like um, Wah Wah, and um, and Waiting on You All, which I think make those songs. I love the intense sound of that. I listened to the original LP, vinyl LP recently, and it sounds fabulous. It's really good. Now, let's start with the remix, just because uh, Paul Hicks and uh, Donnie Harrison worked on this remix. And the whole thing was trying to maybe pull back the spectratization, which is pretty much impossible because a lot of that reverb was embedded in the re in, into these recordings. And how I feel about it, that's what is magic about this record. All Things Must Pass is a magical record. It's, 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 it, it is the godlike, uh, small g, capital G, however you want to talk about your religious uh, interest and spiritual interest. It is George Harrison expressing all this pent-up uh, intensity, musical uh, songmanship and writing, just it's, and it's bursting out over three records, a poster, jams, and it, and it just, I mean, My Sweet Lord Alone, when that came out, is such a dramatic single, it's a joyous single. Again, he gets sued because of He's So Fine, but he really is influenced by Edward Hawkins' Oh Happy Day, and um, I think it's a fabulous single. Now, having said that, the remix. On the whole, I like the remix. I think the weakest link for me personally is My Sweet Lord, because the whole idea is bringing George's vocal up, trying to suppress maybe some of the horns, bring back uh, low some of the echo, some of the reverb, make George's voices drier. Well, George doesn't have the same type of voice as a John Lennon or Paul McCartney. Having said that, I love George's voice, and it really works for him, and he knows how to use it. I think the weakest song on the remix is My Sweet Lord, because you hear the frailty in his voice that you don't hear on the original mix of that. Um, I think it doesn't quite succeed. I do like a lot of the other uh, remixes. Now, I've read some reports that people think the CD is over-compressed and there's too much bass. I didn't experience that myself. A little bit of that, 
Now I listen to the CD in my car, as I said, I listen to the uh, Blu-ray and my main system and the vinyl. I think when all is said and done, the two sweet spots are the Blu-ray, which sounds fabulous, no compression that I hear, a beautiful uh, stereo mix. Now I listen to the uh, 5.1 surround, but my setup isn't ideal for that. So I'm gonna push that off to the side and let someone else really talk about the surround. Um, I dabbled in that about 15, 20 years ago with surround DVD A's and surround system. And I found it, you know, it's novelty, but it wasn't for me. I want to listen to great, true stereo music. So the sweet spot is the Blu-ray in terms of the sound, and that's the uh, 192.24. There's also a, a 4824 uh, variation too. You can set your, uh, your system up to do either, and it sounds great. But I think the vinyl is the, the place to go on this set, and I don't feel it is uh, overly bass heavy. I did get the Uber box. I don't have the individual setups, but I love um, the expanded set because I like the outtakes. Now, we all want to compare how does this rate to other reissues, to other remixes. I personally, as I said, I'm not a huge fan of, of remixing these records. I didn't really love uh, the Be three Beatles records, except the White Album I enjoyed, but Pepper, except for Within You, Without You, ironically, and um, Abbey Road, I go with the original mix, personally. I don't really care for the, re the remixes. And, um, you know, not to take away from uh, Paul Hicks, who worked on this set, and... Um, on some of the other solo Beatle reissues, or Giles Martin, who uh, worked on the Beatles. In a way, I kind of think the family's too close. I think the Abbey Road family is a little too close to all this. And of course, I would prefer a Stephen Wilson maybe remixing these, who has worked with, um, you know, all the prog artists like XTC, who's not really prog, but, and Jethro Tull, and yes, and King Crimson, those fabulous surround mixes. I think they need a new pair of ears working on it from my point of view. Um, even like a Kevin Gray cutting the vinyl, someone uh, like that. Of course, they won't like the, let these tapes out of, uh, out of Abbey Road, I'm sure. So that's kind of my initial take. Um, I want to go through a little bit. This is the book, if you watch the Uber set, this book comes with the Uber set and has the CDs in it. And um, in fact, let me grab the uh, this is the uh, outtakes demos. Love this. This to me is the key. This is the best part of the whole set. The demos, uh, George Harrison did two days in Abbey Road. One day with just him, Klaus Verman, and Ringo Starr, and the second day acoustic guitar presenting more of the songs to um, Phil Spector. Now, that brings me to Klaus Verman, Ringo Starr, and George Harrison. Those three. This past year also, we just got the Plastigono Band uh, 50th anniversary, a little late as well. And it has these great demos, these great works in progress. And what really grabbed me about that was Klaus, Ringo, and John together. That, that triumvirate of musicians was amazing. In a way, I heard the same thing with George, Klaus, and Ringo. They, ha they have something together because they played together before, because they're friends. They go back, you know, 10 years almost by this point um, from the Hamburg days, maybe a little less than 10 years, almost eight years only, I guess. I see a similarity between the Plastigono band and the demos on here. It's not musically, but there's a rawness to it that I really like. Now, again, unfair comparison, but I think a lot of people will give the John Lennon uh, reissues in the McCartney archive, The Edge, because of the packaging, because of all that. Now, I did show the packaging before. I don't have the five CD Blu-ray set that some people think it's physically too small and there's a softback book, and I'm not going to really get into those complaints. Um, but, you know, I tell you, John and Yoko, and Sean and Yoko, I should say, really set the standard high for Plastigona Band and the Imagine box set plus the separate book you can buy. Um, those, I think, really set a bar, a high bar. And um, frankly, uh, this doesn't rise to that. 
And this is my favorite Beatles solo album. Number two is Plastic Ono Band. So the remix. Couple of things. Um, again, as I said, I really like the country flavor. I love the, um, obviously Pete Drake's steel guitar on this. Um, I think the bombasticness of Wah Wah, I like the original better. I, I think they tried to tame it down a little bit to the point where his vocals are dry. That doesn't work quite well for me. But I do like the country or songs like um, Ballad of Sir Frankie Crisp and All Things Must Pass. I Dig Love is especially wonderful on this. I do like that quite a bit. The jams are fun. One of the highlights for me on this is um, the Ballad of Sir Frankie Crisp, obviously the, uh, the lunatic uh, who uh, created Friar Park, uh, who built Friar Park where George's estate. They really mixed up the background vocals. I think a lot of people didn't notice that. And again, a lot of the background and supplemental vocals on this album are brought up more than on the original. Is that necessary? It's interesting. I think the remix is successful being an alternate version, but not a replacement version. That's how I see it. But the, the voices of Sir Frankie Crisp, Sir Frankie Crisp, that go low. And I've heard those, you know, you hear them on headphones and they're there. And I think they go on, you know, they're, they're raised higher here. Necessary? Not quite sure. I almost like them when they're more subliminal, not in your face. So that's just kind of my overall take on the remix. I think it's a nice alternative. Now, I was playing the Blu-ray and I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine who is, um, she's in her, She's in her 40s, and I was playing the Blu-ray, and we were talking about different packages and everything, and she's in the music business, and and I was talking about how the whole concept here by Paul Hicks and Donnie Harrison seems to be they're remixing this album for a younger audience, a newer audience, people who like, you know, more in-your-face recordings, people who like more bass. And, and she said, well, they don't listen to Blu-ray. Young people don't buy Blu-ray. I mean, it seemed like an obvious thing for her to say, but young people don't buy Blu-ray. Young people don't buy CDs. Why do they care? Why would they do that? She said, young people, they only stream or they buy vinyl. That's an interesting thought. So this new, and this isn't only, uh, you know, jumping on Paul Hicks and uh, Donnie Harrison, Sean, it was the same way with Give Me Some Truth. And, you know, they want this new modern mix to sort of compete. Well, music's not a competition. So I don't know, maybe, that, maybe I'm putting words in their mouth. They want the music to, when you're listening to it on a streaming service, maybe, or however you're listening to it, to be at the same levels, to be more compressed. Why don't they do a separate mix then for streaming and let allow these... CDs and these Blu-rays, well, Blu-rays and good, and vinyls, to be more dynamic, to be more natural, to hear the kind of audiophile sounds that, you know, a lot of us middle-aged and older listeners want to hear, if we can hear. That is was a really fair question. Why do they mix these for modern audiences when modern audiences aren't buying the physical versions as much, again, except for vinyl. People who are buying music are buying vinyl. Now, there are exceptions. Someone out there is going to say, I'm young, I buy CDs because they're cheap and everything. But that's not really what I'm talking about here. So I think that is a, a honest question to ask. And again, this isn't just about George Harrison and uh, this box set. This could be about... Um, any version of this. Let's talk about this. To me, this is the sweet spot of the set. To me, this is the reason for this set. Now, another thing when I go on these forums, which is a dangerous thing, and as much as I love them, I despise them. I don't despise them, but there is this kind of attitude and response 
oh, we've heard those already. Why do they include that? Oh, we've heard all these on bootlegs. Oh, we've heard this. We've done this. We've been there. We've listened. When you're doing a, an archive set like this, an anniversary set, you can't go in and say, well, those 30 people or those 6,000 people or those 10 people have heard these bootlegs, so we can't include them. You have to go and put these archive collections together as if none of the outtakes have been heard before. You can't assume, yes, there are collectors and they have everything. I have everything on bootlegs. I have Beware of Atco with all these, you know, horn cuts. And, and sure, I wish they had just the, you know, the tracks of the horn playing alone on some of these tracks or the musical things. And in a way, that's kind of like what uh, Sean has done with the uh, Lennon collections. Um, the archive collections. I think he's got into more of those and the element mixes. And and I think that's something that, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot to live up to for everyone else in the Beatles circles and beyond. Those again, you know, that what Sean uh, kind of, whether he conceived them or not, I think those were pretty wonderful. Um, is it fair to compare what well, we do? How can we not? But this to me, again, is a sweet spot. Now this is the LP collection, five LPs. It, you can buy the uh, eight LP set that has five plus three. That equals eight. My math is important here on these uh, rating videos. This isn't a rating video, but these uh, review videos. So what I showed before in the large uh, box uh, presentation video is what's great about the vinyl. And again, to me, the vinyl is a sweet spot. They come in polyline sleeves, so all you record uh, freaks will love that it's in a beautiful polyline sleeve. But you also get the empty reproduction, or actually in this case, a new production that emulates the original album sleeve. So this was an empty extra sleeve. You know, keep your uh, records in poly sleeves. They'll uh, treat them better, obviously with gnomes. And it goes to the demos. I said d day one and day two are... Uh, George and Abbey Road doing demos. So day one, he says, all things must pass. Behind that locked door, I live for you, Apple Scruffs. Apple Scruffs sounds pretty faithful to the final version. Harmonica added, very, you know, Dylan-like. And I won't get into the specific, specifics of that. But um, I really like these demo versions. They have Ringo and Klaus on, on most of them. Some are electric, uh, some are acoustic. Day two is more the acoustic stuff, uh, the day one of demos. Now, the big difference here song-wise is the version he does of I Dig Love. I love the final version with that piano and, and slide guitar. This is a faster, faster version, entirely different arrangement, and I love it. He does a, a song called Going Down to Golden Green. It's sort of his take on the Elvis, Carl Perkins, Rockabilly Sun Session, a real kind of that, you know, acoustic, electric, rock and roll thing of Sun Records, uh, late 50s. There are two songs here that are very much Indian uh, chants, which I've heard because uh, I have these. So I have heard these, but it's nice to have kind of cleaned up versions. And that's um, Dara Dunn and Om Hare Om Gopala Krishna, Gopala Krishna. And they're very kind of ongoing Indian chants, which I love that music. I'm a big fan of, of George's spiritual Indian side. Um, really love quite a lot that side. I'm a big fan of, you know, Ravi Shankar. Uh, George turned me on to Ravi Shankar and, and Indian music and world music, and Indian classical music. So I collect that stuff as well. On side um, four here, there's a nice version of Let It Roll, the ballad of Sir Fancy Crisp, where, where George does those low voices singing Sir Frank of Sir Frank E. Crisp. Uh, that would be added with other singers on the final version. Uh, My Sweet Lord is just a, a nice acoustic version. And it is a nice uh, version of Sour Milk Sea with um, Ringo and Klaus. That song would later turn up on uh, the album he produced for Jackie Lomax on Apple Records. Day two, the demos, it really shows the brilliance and the folk side. Those records I was showing at the beginning, New Morning, Bukuza Blues, The Band, uh, really that spiritual gospel 
country folk sound, I think, really comes through. Now, this could have been an option. That, this could have been a great album as a New Morning. Now, remember, New Morning wasn't a huge Dylan album in 1970. It was a transition period. You know, the singer-songwriter thing was was coming up. The solo records were coming up with Elton John and, and James Taylor and the like and many others. And I think it was the right choice to make this large, full wall of sound Phil Spector produced record. Now, if you choose Phil Spector, that's what you're going to get. Obviously, John Lennon and Yoko Ono tamed him back in Plastic Ono Band because it's not a real bombastic record, aside from John's intensity and his the shit he was going through. But um, there's a take here of uh, Window Window, which is a song, uh, again, never released officially, but on bootlegs. Beautiful Girl, Take One. And most of the takes I found on these demos are either Take One or Two, with a few exceptions. Mostly Take One throughout these uh, demo discs from the, the first day and the second day at Abbey Road. But Beautiful Girl is a song that he would later do on uh, his debut on Warner Brothers' 33 and a third album. Let It Down. Um, there's some Dylan stuff he does on here, obviously, if not for you, and uh, Nowhere to Go. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. it was a song he ended up uh, releasing on a soundtrack of Porky's Revenge. And it's a Dylan uh, authored song that uh, would turn up on that crazy soundtrack. Interesting place for that to turn up. Um, also, Cosmic Empire is released as a video as a single in a way or a, a advance from this album. It's really kind of a nice folky cosmic thing. But again, the brilliance of this are these acoustic guitar demos, the demos with Klaus and Ringo that I really um, love and makes this collection work. And that's why I would not personally go with just a CD or a record of the remix. If you have an original, I don't think you need the remix. Now, again, going back, I'm going full circle. I know I'm kind of ranting and, and, and not being as precise as I would like to be, but a lot of it has to do with I'm used to these records, and a lot of us are used to these records. After 50 years, they're embedded in. So hearing these remixes, we hear it in a different variation. It's it's unsettling, maybe, at first. However, I've listened to everything about six times now, and I've gotten used to some of the remixes that initially I was sort of put off by. I like Phil Spector's contribution and I think he lifted this production to what it was. And I think it was important to do that right out of the gate for George Harrison in 1970, coming, you know, off the whole, the the Beatles, you know, eight years with the Beatles and making records with the Beatles. Um, and think about it, as they were recording it, I mean, George was a participant here. I know even years later in the 2001 remix, I think, he kind of bitched about he'd like to take some of the stuff off the horns and the and the wall of sound from Phil Spector. But remember, John Lennon also once said in the 70s, he wishes he could record all the Beatle records over again. So, you know, we all go through these moods and what we like and different tastes. I wish I could get rid of that tinkling piano bullshit sound on every record in, in, from the 1980s with that electronic drum sound. Not, not going to happen, is it? I'm a fan of this record. I'm a fan of All Things Must Pass. I applaud them. Happy birthday, all things must pass. My favorite uh, Beatle record, solo Beatle record. Uh, and there's a ranking below. In fact, I'll include that link. A lot of links. You got a lot of homework here. So if you haven't watched that, there's a link below to my uh, favorite solo Beatle albums ranked. Spoiler number one, Plastic Owner Man number two. So I hope that gives you a, a good take, just my personal opinion. Again, I'm coming from, you know, having listen to this record 50 years on. Enjoy the music. Enjoy the anniversary. Uh, thanks for watching. Watch the other videos all linked below in your spare time. And Mazzy loves you.